Welcome everyone to the webinar, Transgender Youth Sexual Assault Survivors, Skills for Advocates. My name is Jen Friedlander and I'm the organizer for today's webinar. Today's webinar will support advocates throughout Washington State in gaining practical skills to work with trans and non-binary survivors who are teens and preteens. The Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs is a nonprofit organization that strives to unite agencies engaged in the elimination of sexual violence. WICSAP provides information, training, and expertise to program and individual members who support victims, family and friends, the general public, and all those whose lives have been affected by sexual assault. Before we get started, I wanted to just go over some logistical information about this webinar. Throughout the presentation, your line will be muted. However, there is a chat feature at the bottom, of, the bottom left of your screen, um, and you can ask questions in the chat feature. Please ask questions or give comments throughout the webinar. Our facilitators, Michael, Laurie, and Katie, will be paying attention to your questions. Michael will answer questions at the end of the presentation, but we will answer any logistical questions that come up throughout the webinar. The materials from this presentation will be recorded, archived, and posted on the WICSAP website approximately one week after the webinar. If you're sharing a computer with your colleague to attend this webinar, you can email the names of the other participants to jen at wixap.org. This webinar will count as 1.5 hours of ongoing training credits and you will receive a follow-up email from us for your records. Please take a few minutes following this webinar to fill out the evaluation. Michael Munson is today's presenter. Michael is the co-founder and executive director of FORGE, an organization focused on improving the lives of transgender survivors. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Michael. Thanks, Jen. I'm glad to be here too, and I'm also glad to be here with my colleagues, Larry Cook-Daniels and Katie Taylor. So we're actually going to be sharing more of the space than I had originally thought, so um, gay for us. Um, so we're really glad to be here and um, joining you all again. We did a webinar with Wixap in, I believe it was January, and so this is a, a second in, in a two-part series, so we're thrilled to, to be here again with everybody. So I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping as well. I know Jen you know, did some logisticals about the webinar software, and I just wanted to remind people to um, take care of yourselves and, and with the reminder that the webinar is being recorded and we are more than happy to share the PowerPoints with you all. So I know sometimes when we, we talk about sexual assault, even if we do it every day, sometimes things are a bit touching and, and are a little bit too painful to, to listen to, and sometimes we have daily emergencies or other things that we need to take care of. So please do what you need to do and we will um, make sure that you get the whole thing by the, the recording or by the PowerPoints after, the, after we end today. So let me share with you a little bit about um, what we're going to do today. Um, I know some of you have been on Forge webinars in the past, and we tend to be fairly fast-paced and generally data-driven and usually resource and skills focused. And I'm hoping that today's webinar will, will live up to those um, expectations that some of you might have. But we're also going to be using the use of uh, three role plays today, which is a little bit different than what we often do. And I think that in many ways these role plays will provide some really good kind of how-to examples in working with transgender youth. So hopefully that will, will do the trick. And if it doesn't, there's plenty of time, I hope, at the end for us to do some Q&A and have some, some deeper discussion around it. Um, so our agenda for the day is I want to give you a little bit of a, a thumbnail of who Forge is, just so you know what kind of resources that we can um, provide you with and how, how we can help you. And we want to do a little bit of Trans 101, but not very much. We'll do a little bit, again, on data around trans youth and sexual violence, again, just a little bit. And then we'll, we'll dive more into the, the heart of what we're going to talk about, so developmental trauma and the ACE study, so the um, Adverse Childhood Experiences Research. And then we're going to do some tack on. So if we, if we wrote the ACE thing to look at trans youth, what would we add on to that? Or what else are our influences for trans youth? We'll talk about confidentiality and privacy and autonomy and agency, both through the use of a role play, which hopefully, again, will be a really good example of, of those two areas of subjects. And then we'll end with some resources and what you can do. And we have quite a few of them in that section. And then hopefully we'll have some time for, for Q&A. So let me tell you a little bit about who forges. We are a, a trans organization that is 100% focused, um, funded to focus on anti-violence issues related to trans survivors. 
We were founded in 1994, so this makes it uh, 22 years that we've been around. And we're headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at least most of our staff is, and our work is totally national, so we do very little here in Wisconsin. We predominantly work with victim service providers, so around 75% of our, our staff time and effort is providing training and technical assistance with providers, and the remaining 25% or so is working directly with trans or gender non-binary survivors and loved ones. So we are a national training and technical assistance provider through the Office of Violence Against Women. We have two foundational principles that really guide all of our work, and when we engage with both survivors or providers, our number one goal is to work through a trauma-informed lens, and that's always something that we have to, to keep kind of chasing our tail about because because trauma-informed changes very rapidly and, and what that means changes um, from day to day. The second foundational principle, again, in how we work both with survivors and providers is to focus on empowerment um, through highlighting resilience, building on existing knowledge, and promoting a sense of confidence. So like I mentioned on the first slide, um, we, we have a small staff, and all, all three of our full-time staff are here today, and um, let me just give you a little thumbnail of, of each of us. So I'm, I'm Forge's executive director and um, all-around grunt, but mostly um, my work is as a trainer in, in addition to um, overseeing the projects and publications that we put out. Lori Cook-Daniels is our policy and program director. She's central in mostly in product development, specifically in our written documents, and guiding policy and discussion on federal, state, and local levels. And Katie Taylor is our community engagement and project coordinator for several different initiatives. Um, you'll see some photos today that are part of the Espavo project, and she is um, kind of the lead on that project. And you'll probably see her if you come to any national conferences, because she will probably be, be tabling with us there. I wanted to let folks know where you can connect with us on social media. And again, this is not I, to toot our horn about things, and I always feel a little bit awkward sharing this, but this is really where we put out most information that will probably be useful to you. So if we have a new publication or a new webinar, or if we learn of what other people are doing that is around trans folks and victimization, you'll probably will see it posted through one of our social media outlets. So we encourage you to live tweet things. If you're live tweeting today, please please tag us so that we can can raise your voice as well. So I'd like to really, really quickly um, point out some Trans 101 concepts and mostly focused on youth. If you would like to have more knowledge that kind of gives give the background to what we're going to talk about today, I encourage you to look at um, one of our 101 webinars, which you can find easily on our website. Our, our URL is at the bottom of the slide, um, which is uh, forgeforward.org. And you can, you can check out any of them, but we encourage you to check out the one that was on um, in February. So I think it's a really good one for advocates to have some basic core knowledge. So just a couple of points about like how many trans people are there and why are we talking about trans people when it's probably a really small number of, of the population? And it's a good question, but there's probably more trans people out in the world than, than many people think about. So when we look at um, prevalence rates, it's always difficult to determine because everybody defines transgender in a different sort of way and includes or excludes different fractions of the, the population or different people's identities. In addition, not everybody who has a transgender history would self-identify as transgender now. So there are many factors that contribute to us knowing or not knowing, actually, what the percentage is of the population who is transgender. And especially that's true of youth, I think, who have more um, malleable identities, sometimes early on in their lives. Um, however, what we tend to use is 1%. The Williams Institute is a little bit more conservative and, and estimates around 0.3% of the population. But Lynn Conway and many other researchers um, believe that it's around 1% of the population. So youth are, are doing some really interesting things, and they're moving away from traditional gender constructs to ideas that encompass more gender fluidity as well as less rigidity with sexual orientation and any number of things that we typically have had in a binary sort of thinking, so a black, white, male, female kind of way. Uh, there was a study done in 
2015, in March, I believe it was, 2016, um, by Fusion, and it was over a 1,000 youth, youth, and they found that um, half of millennials, so these are the 21 to 41-year-olds, so not really youth, so the Generation Y folks, they believe that gender exists on a spectrum and shouldn't be limited to the categories of male and female. So this trend continues when we look at folks who are in the gen, Generation Z. So those are the age, basically one, birth now to around age 21. And 56% of, of the folks that are Gen Zers know somebody who uses gender neutral pronouns such as they or Z. Um, and we anticipate that this trend will continue um, and gender as we know it today is probably going to morph into something new by the time these Generation Z youth reach adulthood. So one of the things that you might hear is your clients using language that you might not be familiar with. And I think this is particularly true for trans youth, but it can be true of trans people of any age. And language is just such an incredible thing that evolves over time. And um, I know that, that there are words that I hear sometimes, and I have to try to figure out what they mean, too. And I'm, I'm surrounded by trans language every single day. So I, I made this little teeny word cloud of, of 62 words out of the hundreds of words that young people are using these days. And just to give you a couple of ideas of what some of those words are that you may hear when you're working with clients, um, a lot of young people are identifying as non-binary. Some are identifying as agender or gender fluid. We're seeing a lot lately people that are using um, AFAB, so assigned female at birth, or AMAB, assigned male at birth. We're also seeing a lot of youth that identify as demi-boys or demi-girls, so a gender that's partly male, partly non-binary, could be assigned male at birth, assigned female at birth. We're seeing a lot of youth identify as NB, so E-N-B-Y, so non-binary, but spelled out a little bit differently, or epicene, or masculine of center. So those are just a couple of ideas of, of the language that you might hear when working with trans youth. And one of the other things that we're seeing, and this is really something that's happening um, quite recently, is a duality in terms of access to transition-related services. So keeping in mind that not all trans people want to transition, some of the folks that do want to transition, what we're seeing is that there's, there's this split, that there's, on the one hand, some increased access for youth, so um, more and more parents are accepting and embracing their children's gender identity at very early ages. And many of these parents are supporting their children through things like hormone blockers, which basically pushes the button on puberty, allowing pushes the stop button on, on puberty, allowing children more time to explore their gender identity and become more firm in their decisions before taking more permanent actions. These parents, too, are, are often the ones who are supporting access to legal name changes when that's appropriate or hormo hormone or surgery as that's appropriate in their child's life. On the other hand, the other side of that duality is um, limited access. So youth oftentimes have less access to transition-related services and options if they would want to transition socially, medically, or legally. These youth might not have access to trans-related medical services because of things like they can't afford it, they don't have the transportation to get to where they need to go, like the doctor's office, they may not have insurance on their own, or they might have parents that are not accepting and um, would block their, their process. Trans youth who come into your office may fall into either one of these two camps or maybe youth who are not interested in transitioning at all. I mentioned before that Katie is uh, centrally involved with the Espavo project, and this is a photo that was recently taken at um, the Transgender uh, Health Conference, I'm sorry, not the, yeah, the Philadelphia Trans Health Conference in um, Philadelphia a couple of weeks ago. And these are just amazing young people who are all over the conference. Um, it's the largest conference um, in the world that's focused on trans issues. So throughout the webinar, you, you will see some, some images of, of folks, and I just wanted to give the caveat that we have permission to use all the images. Um, not every image is going to necessarily include a trans person, but most do. And um, not every image is going to include survivors, but most do. So let's move on and talk a little bit about data to help frame the impact of sexual assault on trans youth. 
to be clear up front, we have really limited studies on trans people of any age in sexual assault, and even less data on trans, gender nonconforming, or gender nonbinary youth who have been sexually assaulted. This is a, a slide that, that some of you might be tired of seeing if you've, if you've heard me present um, before, but I always start data sections with this slide from Brene Brown. And if you don't know who Brene Brown is, I really encourage you to um, check out her TED Talks or her books. She's an incredible researcher who mostly focuses on shame and vulnerability. And this quote is, um, is just really pertinent to when we look at data. She says that stories are just data with a soul. And I'd like to keep this in mind when we look at, at things like numbers, because sometimes when we look at numbers, we get a little bit numbed out, and we don't always realize or connect those numbers with real people's lives. And, and I know that's obvious, but sometimes, you know, I know that I need the reminder of that, and sometimes, you know, we all do. So I'm going to share with you just a few bits of numeric data and again, we don't have a lot of data for youth in particular. So these numbers are, are all trans people in general, not youth specific. So in general, we, we find that research supports that between 50 and 66% of trans people have experienced sexual violence at some point in their life. Um, many uh, studies are, are smaller and look at um, different kinds of prevalence rates. So based on um, subpopulations within the trans community, um, I don't know of very many that, that look at youth in particular. So this is a lot of trans people that are, are affected by sexual assault, though. I wanted to show a couple of slides that are not directly about sexual assault, but may have some overlap with sexual assault. Um, the rates of intimate partner violence is a bit higher for trans people than for non-trans individuals. The Williams Institute uh, conducted a, a meta-analysis in 2015, and they found that someplace between 25 and 50 percent of trans people, again, trans people, people of all ages, experienced IPV at some point in their life. We don't have youth-specific data, but what we've seen um, is that trans youth tend to make um, higher risk choices in dating that may end up in situations where IPV is more likely to occur. For example, a lot of trans youth feel that nobody will love them, so they might settle for a relationship or a partner who's abusive versus not having any partner at all. They may also exchange sex for survival needs like housing or food, which may put them in, in risk situations that might result in sexual assault or, or IPV in higher rates. So again, for stalking, we don't have great data. The general U.S. public um, generally is, is thought to be between 5 and 17 percent of the U.S. public has experienced stalking of some kind at some point in their life. And trans people are basically double that um, or up to the upper end of that, so 15 to 20 percent. And again, those are adults and people of all ages. When we look at youth, we know that youth in general, so not trans youth in particular, but youth in general, are oftentimes engaging in technology-based stalking, and we're you know, certain that this is happening for trans youth as well as, as non-trans youth. So I'm sure that um, if, if research was done, we'd find that stalking is happening both in terms of online as well as, um, as in person. So here's some, some youth-specific data, and we don't have a whole lot of it, but this is um, some data that was collected through the National Center for Transgender Equality at, with a study called Injustice at Every Turn. And it's based on a, a really large sample size of over 6,400 trans people. And this survey um, noted that in grades K through 12, 78% of the trans students um, were harassed based on their gender identity or gender expression. 35% of them were physically assaulted and 12% were sexually assaulted. So again, that's grades K through 12. And these rates are inclusive of both um, teachers and students who are um, engaging in abusive behavior. So it's not just peer-to-peer, -peer, it's adult to student. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see that 6% um, of the, the the students were expelled um, based on their gender identity or their gender expression, and 15% of the, the students dropped out of school due to violence. 
So what that might mean is that around 20%, 21% of trans youth didn't finish high school, and some of them may not have gone on to get their GEDs. Um, some of them have. And that, of course, leads to things like people living on the streets, people not having um, you know, a good education. That leads to good jobs. So there's some risk that may end up happening based on youth that are, are kicked out of school or voluntarily leaving school and possibly leaving home as well. And the last data slide that I wanted to share with you is, is on suicide and suicide attempts. Um, I don't think we can um, talk about suicide often enough. It certainly is a, an epidemic, I think, in our country, and specifically very much of an epidemic within the trans community and among youth, trans and LGB youth. So if we look at the slide, um, the general U.S. population has a suicide attempt rate of under 5%. When we look at this, this really large study, again, over 6,400 people that responded, 41% of the respondents said that they had attempted suicide. Not thought about it, but attempted suicide. What's interesting what's, is, is the kind of the breakout of, of the intersection. So we, when we look at trans folks who have been sexually assaulted, that rate goes up to 64% people that are trans and have been sexually assaulted by teachers, that rate of suicide attempt goes up to 69%. And interestingly, students that were physically assaulted by teachers, their suicide attempt rate goes up to 76%. So those are profoundly high numbers. Um, a number that doesn't happen to be on the screen is about youth who were bullied in schools. Um, that rate of youth who are bullied in schools is 51% who attempt suicide. So those are really profound numbers. And I'm sharing that because I think it's, it's important for when we look at survivors of sexual assault who are trans and young people that this might be part of their lived reality or something that may be in their future. So as we can see by the, the data that was just discussed, trans youth have really high rates of sexual abuse and violence in their life, as well as many other forms of violence. A common first place for for many survivors to start is through a rape crisis line. And what we're going to move into next is Katie and Laurie are going to role play an interaction with uh, someone calling a rape crisis line. And let me just set up the, the role play for us. Um, we have uh, Grandma Violet, who takes care of her granddaughter, Loray, after school that, um, almost every day and on most weekends. Loray's parents are divorced, and her father has primary custody. Grandma Violet and Loray have a close relationship. Loray is seven years old, and this conversation is between Grandma Violet and the rape crisis staff person. Yes, my granddaughter just told me that she was touched inappropriately. I hope you can tell me. He was so upset when he was dropped off at my house today, and I don't know what to do. Something's just not right with her. Something happened. I'm glad you called us. We are here to help. Now, I don't think you understand. I am so worried. We usually play, and she has a good time, but today she's just sitting in a chair and staring at the TV. She said something happened, that someone touched his Peter. Is your grandchild safe with you right now? Yes. Would it be okay then if I asked you a couple of questions? Yes, of course, please. Thank you. I want to be sure that I heard you correctly. You said your grandchild told you they were inappropriately touched. Is that right? I want to make sure I talk about your grandchild accurately. And I heard you use both he and she. Is there a pronoun you or your grandchild prefer? Uh. I'm so sorry. Yes, of course. I'm so upset right now. I just can't think straight. It's okay. Take your time. Okay, well, see, I, I didn't mean to slip up. My granddaughter is seven years old. She is my son's only child, his son. So my granddaughter knew when she was three years old that she's a girl. She told me her name is Larray, and she wants me to call her my granddaughter. So I always use him my pronouns with her. Her father is so upset with this, though, and I guess I guess I'm just a little flustered right now. So, when my son dropped her off, he was really upset. You know, she has on a bandana to try and pull her hair back, and she's also wearing her pink Converse sneakers. And I could tell that my son was really angry about what she was wearing. He never calls her Larray, and he gets 
so irate when I do or when I use female pronouns. He just doesn't accept her as his daughter, as a girl. I'm sorry that both you and Lorraine have to deal with this lack of acceptance. That must be difficult. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but what I'm most concerned about, I, I'm really concerned that he may have been the one that touched her. I do not know what to do. It is hard to know what to do. I'm glad you called us. We can help you figure out some options. I hope so. I am very, very worried. Okay, so that was role play number one. And um, we hope to do that to, to clarify a little bit about how rape crisis line workers can clarify somebody's name and pronoun. So let me break down a little bit about what we heard, because I think there's some, some really important things that we heard in this really short role play. And one of the things that I think is, is so critical is that when advocates learn how to be advocates, when advocates are called to be advocates, I think one of the skills that, that just about every advocate has is to, to really engage in good active listening. And that's what I think we heard in this role play is that the advocate was, um, the Red Cross line worker was, was really, really carefully listening and she picked up on the language inconsistency right away and waited for a good time to ask a clarifying question. Second, she asked the, the clarifying question in a sensitive way, asking permission to ask the question, and then noting that she wanted to respect the grandmother and the grandchild's language and identities. The third thing in terms of breaking this down is that um, as they talked, it seemed like the grandmother may not have realized beforehand that the abuse might be happening from her son to her granddaughter. So this may be something that she, she learned as they, they talked on the phone. And the last thing is a reminder that, you know, I think many of us know this, but it's not always the survivor who calls rape crisis lines, but, but loved ones do as well. So um, there might be some disclosure around trans issues, even when somebody else is calling. So I'm going to hand this over to Laurie to talk a, a little bit about some developmental trauma. Thank you, Michael. Um, we felt it was really important to talk about developmental trauma. Since trans youth often experience high levels of direct and secondary trauma early in life, which can have some serious effects on their later emotional, cognitive, and physical development and their health. Many of you are aware of the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Research. If you are not familiar, we urge you to become familiar because it's really, really groundbreaking and important. This study originated in California's Kaiser Permanente HMO in their weight control clinic. They noticed that some of the patients who were successfully losing weight were dropping out of the program, and they wanted to know why. As they conducted interviews, they realized that a lot of the people who dropped out had experienced serious problems in childhood. So they designed and conducted a study of 17,000 patients who just wanted a physical. They asked people whether they had experienced any of 10 different adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. The ACEs included three types of child abuse, emotional, physical, or sexual, and two types of child neglect, physical and emotional. They also asked about five situations that may have affected the whole household, asking if anyone in the family the child grew up in had substance abuse problems, or mental illness, if the person's parents had been separated or divorced, or if one or more of the person's parents had gone to jail. Note that this study was done when many people still erroneously believed that only women can be abused, so the final ACE asked only if the person's mother had been abused. The researchers did not attempt to gauge how bad each type of adverse childhood experience was. If you said you had ever experienced a type of emotional child abuse, you got one ace point, the same as someone who had experienced a whole lot of emotional abuse. As a result, the scoring ran from zero, the patient had a childhood that had included none of the adverse child experiences, to 10, the patient had experienced all of the enumerated aces during childhood. The researchers then compared the ACE scores to the patient's health record, 
looking at a wide variety of health indicators, including not just such things as alcoholism and smoking, but also things like heart disease and cancer. What they found was that almost all of the results looked like this chart, where the patients with no ACEs had the smallest chances of having that health condition or risk behavior. Two, step by step, the highest rate among those who had the most ACEs. In conditions where we know the risks are higher with some things, like we know heart disease is higher in smokers, they controlled for that factor, and it still turned out that if you had more ACEs, you were more likely to have a given health condition. The researchers suggested that the relationship works like this. Someone has one or more adverse childhood experiences, and they spend more time trying to survive or cope with those experiences, and less time than other children do developing their social, emotional, and cognitive skills. As a result, they have a deficit there. Having social, emotional, or cognitive impairment in turn creates interpersonal problems that the person may try to self-medicate or self-soothe with high-risk behaviors like smoking, drinking, using drugs, and high-risk sexual behavior. Those behaviors in turn lead to health problems and to additional social problems like the outcome of driving while under the influence. Ultimately, they found people with high A scores actually tended, on average, to have shorter lifespans. What's important to note here is that sustained childhood trauma actually changes people's brains. The traumatized brain becomes more easily pushed into fear and reactions than the non-traumatized brain does. At the same time, people traumatized in childhood also develop fewer life skills. They're great at surviving adversity, but that ability comes at the cost of having lower skills devoted to growth and development, all of which means youth traumatized in childhood are both more sensitive to everyday challenges and tend to have fewer skills than do their non-traumatized peers. The ACE researchers summarized their findings in another blunt and almost shocking way. They simply assert adverse childhood experiences are the main determinant of the health and social well-being of the nation. Michael, back to you. Okay, so that was that was really kind of, of heavy material, but um, as I said in the beginning, we really try to be trauma-informed, and I think this, this work is really critical to understand, and, and now we're gonna bring it into a more trans-related con content and, and concept. So trans youth are obviously just as likely as non-trans youth to be in households where they experience adverse childhood events. For trans youth, though, they may experience other challenges specifically related to being transgender. We'd like to explore a few of these now because these factors influence overall wellness as well as risk-taking behaviors and ultimately may result in higher rates of sexual violence in their lives. So if we could add on to the factors that Kaiser looked at in the ACE study and include indicators that are trans-specific, we would probably add some of the following. Um, these are just, you know, what we've come up with. There are probably other things that are, are really relevant as well. But we would add bullying and harassment, parental denial of identity, parental expulsion from home, police misconduct or harassment, microaggressions, minority stress, legislated discrimination or policies, and culture-wide transphobia. So let's take a little bit uh, deeper look at all of these things um, to give some more perspective. So bullying and, and harassment um, can happen at school, at home, in the neighborhood, on the streets, in places of worship, at extracurricular activities, or any other public space, or even in private spaces. Bullying in any of these environments can be um, by age peers or by adults or by others who are in authority. And of course, bullying can be both verbal um, or emotional or physical or sexual. 
unfortunately, when, when people become parents, they don't get a, a handy little instruction book that, that tells them how to deal with adversity or deal with difference or deal with children that they may not be, be expecting to have characteristics um, of. So many parents don't know what to do when their, their child um, may be different than what they expected related to their gender or physical or cognitive ability or their beliefs or any number of factors. Some parents actively push against their child's identity, denying their child's ability to self-define and express themselves and their gender in their truest form. What this means for trans youth is that they either stay at a home and they live in an environment where they can't be um, accepted for who they are, or they may leave home voluntarily or not in hopes of being able to live more in congruous with their gender identity and with less violence and harassment. So all too often, trans and LGBT youth are kicked out of their homes. Very few studies have looked at trans youth specifically, but we know that 40% of homeless youth are LGBT. The charts on the screen right now indicate the top three reasons why LGBT um, homelessness um, exists, and that includes 69% um, um, is related to parental rejection. 69% is also the number for abuse that's occurring within the family, so that's physical, emotional, or sexual abuse within the family. 62% um, um, is aggression around or violence in the family. So, you know, clearly those things are all related to violence and why the, the kids are, are leaving home. So youth that are kicked out of their homes, which is, as you can see, um, are really oftentimes very violent, um, are then on the streets, which then is filled with even more violence and a heightened risk of harm. So that kind of leads us directly to police misconduct. Since many trans youth are homeless or survive through the street economy, many have unwanted contact with police. And of course, you know, some police are extremely well-trained and respectful. Many, though, are abusive to youth in general and trans youth in particular. People who are surviving through sex work or other street economies may have more direct contact with police, which might result in increased opportunities for inappropriate or abusive police behavior. Trans people have repeatedly reported high rates of, of verbal, emotional, physical, and sexual abuse from law enforcement. And of course, law enforcement um, officers who may engage in um, misconduct may end up arresting trans youth, and that just puts them in higher risk if they're incarcerated. Trans communities like places in places like New Orleans or Washington, D.C. or New York City have tried to make a difference in how police and trans people are interacting. They're trying to shift things like the stop and frisk laws or decriminalizing sex work and trying to give space to homeless youth. Breakout is a youth-led New Orleans organization dedicated to ending criminalization of LGBT youth with a very heavy focus on trans youth. And the picture on the screen is, is a bunch of their youth um, and the art behind them, which is kind of cool. So another one of the things that, that if we wanted to add to the, the ACE study that we would add is microaggressions. Trans people are exposed to dozens of microaggressions every day. Youth are likely exposed to even more um, just by the very nature of being around other youth who sometimes can be insensitive or unknowingly harmful um, in their words or their actions. Microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate derogatory or negative slights and insults, or even some hostility towards a group of people. These words and actions establish, reflect, and reinforce the dominant paradigm, erasing the experiences and realities of a minority. Each event, observation, and experience is not necessarily particularly striking in and of itself. Often, they're never meant to cause harm. Um, they're just acts done with very little conscious awareness of their meaning and their effects. Instead, the gradual buildup uh, throughout childhood and over a lifetime is what defines the pain and marginalization that often um, create trans people to feel this sense of fear in their lives. So trans people across the country are being inundated with these, these negative, hurtful messages which contribute to minority stress. 
minority stress is the result of observable incidents, vigilance for future incidents, and a person's decision that the incident is related to the person's minority status. As a result, they internalize this process as stress. And you know, I'd want to note here that the, the minority stress here is a, a stress with a capital S, big stress. Living with minority stress on a daily basis can and does have negative health implications, both physical and emotional. Additionally, people who are inundated with these kinds of messages, as well as those who might be living on the street or in non-optimal living environments, resort to doing things like buying weapons, using drugs or alcohol as a means of coping, engaging in non-suicidal self-injury behaviors like cutting, or lashing out at others because of how overwhelmed they feel by just living in this world. So as Lurie pointed out before, many don't have adequate coping skills or the support around them to respond differently to life situations. We know that youth are also hearing the same messages that the adults around them are hearing, and maybe the adults around them are saying. Um, in the past several months, I think most of us have heard um, very many anti-trans legislative um, actions being introduced. Um, either they're proposed or they've already been signed into law that allow or even encourage discrimination against transgender individuals. Laws like HB2 and schools that are pushing back against Title IX protections for trans youth result in youth not having a safe, non-stigmatizing place to do things like go to the bathroom or change their clothes at school. But these types of laws and policies deeply impact the lives and well-being of trans and non-binary youth, making it impossible for them to participate fully in school, which often results in them dropping out or suffering from physical or emotional distress. For some, they're unafraid to even be, literally be in this world, um, anywhere out of fear of being discriminated against or experiencing violence because of their gender identity or expression. One of the other things that has come out of this legislation, too, is uh, a fear of being perceived as a sexual predator, which is what a lot of the legislation is really aimed at, is that trans people are somehow sexual predators, which is, is very, very untrue. And the last um, piece that we wanted to add on to kind of the ACE study is this culture-wide discrimination um, or transphobia. Youth are not immune to a culture that does not embrace trans people and which often um, is openly hostile or discriminatory. Youth do see the pervasiveness of the media that only shows binary genders and politicians who don't believe that trans or LGBT people should be protected, or even worse, that some people are thinking that trans people are not even human, deserving of, of basic respect. The, the drawing on the right side of the screen is um, an image that somebody drew of Leela Alcorn, who was a trans teen who ended her life um, a couple of years ago, two years ago. Um, and she wrote in her suicide um, note, to fix society, please. And this has been a message, I think, that a lot of the trans community has moved forward and really um, used as a, a very powerful phrase to try to affect some change in the world. So we're going to shift next to talking about confidentiality and privacy. And I know that Folks that work with youth and folks that work with sexual assault survivors um, are really familiar with concepts of com confidentiality and privacy. So I'm not going to set this up very much because I think we all kind of have an idea of what this means. So Katie and Marie are going to role play um, a situation that, that addresses confidentiality and privacy. So let me, let me set up the situation for us and then they will take it away. So. In this situation, we've got a 13-year-old student who voluntarily heads to the guidance counselor's office at their school. The student has a trusting relationship with the guidance counselor and tells them that they were sexually assaulted yesterday and need some help. The guidance counselor talks with the student for a long time and at some point asks the students if they'd like to have a rape crisis advocate called in to talk with them. The student agrees, and this is the interaction that takes place between the advocate and the student in a closed-door office. 
Hi, I know we already introduced ourselves, but I wanted to be on a first name basis with you. Mr. Hernandez was all formal and introduced me as Ms. Torres. Please just call me Juana. Your guidance counselor said your name was James. Do you go by James or do you have a nickname or other name that you use? So listen, I have something to tell you before we go any further. And if this isn't cool with you, I don't want to have any more conversation, okay? Okay, I'm listening. I'm trans. You know transgender? Are you down with that? Yes, of course. I appreciate you telling me. That's no problem. Okay, well, my parents call me James. All of my teachers here call me James, just like you heard. My friends call me Jamie. Would you like me to call you Jamie? Yeah, well, yeah, but, well, wait, what? Wait, wait a second. Okay, what's up? Maybe I shouldn't have told you that. Are you going to be talking to my parents? Are you going to talk to the guidance counselor? I mean, they don't know. I don't think I should have told you. It's okay, really. This is important to talk about. I want to make sure I can interact with you and anyone else in ways that are right and safe for you. Okay, well, here's the deal. So my friends know. My parents probably have a clue. Like, duh, it's kind of obvious. But I don't know what they do if I actually told them. I mean, I definitely don't want to tell them now after this just happened. I can get that. What I'm hearing from you is that you'd like me to call you Jamie when we're alone, but when we're in a room with other people, you'd like me to use James. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not ready for them to know yet. Is there more you'd like to tell me about your gender, your name, your pronouns, or anything like that? No, not really. Okay. I'm opening to listen to listening. I'm open to listening if you want to share more. But I know that you asked me to come here today because someone touched you without your consent. Would you like to share with me what happened or what has been going on? Okay, so that was role play two that really addressed this concept of confidentiality and privacy. And I think it's it's a little bit different than what we normally think about or hear about. So let's break this down a little bit, too. Um, again, I think what we heard was that um, this advocate was doing a really good job at listening. And um, let's just start from the top of the role play, which, again, was really short. But in this case, um, this young teen was very quick to self-disclose. And Jamie didn't want to talk with somebody who wasn't going to be okay with, with all of who um, they were. And so like many teens, Jamie blurted out their transness and then somewhat regretted it afterwards. And I, you know, I'm not, this is not necessarily a trans specific thing, but I think a lot of teens say things and then go, oh my God, what did I just say? So um, I think, you know, we saw that in, in this dialogue, which I think is really nice and human and, and, and normal for us to see. And the advocate confirmed um, who knew what and what names to use in what situations. And, he sh and, and she assured Jamie that she would respect Jamie's wishes, um, at least about the trans piece. Um, you know, what we didn't go into here was things around mandatory reporting, which um, is a whole other um, issue um, because this is clearly a minor at somebody when somebody's 13. Um, Jamie seemed to be more than willing to trust people about the information about sexual assault, but not so much about um, things with transness. So Jamie definitely trusted the advocate, which is kind of interesting, somebody that Jamie hadn't met, but um, you know, didn't trust parents or school people about knowing um, their trans status. So that's just an interesting thing to keep in mind that some people may be more willing or interested or able to talk about their sexual assault than their trans identity or history, and sometimes it might be the other way around. Um, a quick reminder, too, that um, you know, non-disclosure, so the, the lack of, of telling somebody that um, a person is trans doesn't mean deception. I think that, that a lot of times we think that, that if somebody doesn't um, say right away that they're automatically deceiving. So, um, you know, Jamie will likely come out to the people in their life when they're ready and when they feel safe to do so. One of the things that, um, you know, again, we didn't talk about, which I mentioned just a second ago, was, was the role of mandatory reporting. And I'm sure that those of you who work with youth have some ways of navigating these issues, and I think everybody kind of 
handles them differently. Um, I know some advocates um, are really upfront with youth, telling them right away that they're mandatory reporters and what that means. So sometimes the youth can um, do things like say a friend of mine and this happened and use hypotheticals or find other ways that don't necessarily disclose that they're talking about their own experiences. Because um, I think a lot of us know that sometimes mandatory reporting for as good and powerful as it is ends up causing some more harm. So, you know, if there's family abuse going on and there's mandatory reporting, that sometimes makes the, the abuse that's happening at home worse. Um, and if we've got a trans youth, um, it may make things worth worse for that trans youth at home or in other locations as well. So um, ideally, if it's a mandatory reporting situation, um, there can be some discussion if, if the youth is old enough to have that discussion and understand what it might mean, because I think we all care about um, survivors being as safe as possible and not causing more harm to them. So that discussion is, is a little bit bigger than what we're going to be talking about today, but that gives you, gives you some things to think about. Let's move on and talk a little bit about autonomy and agency. I think most of us that work in, in sexual assault fields really want survivors and, you know, do what we can to encourage autonomy, um, control, um, letting the, the survivor be in the driver's seat. So we'd like to do another role play about autonomy and agency. So the following role play is um, with a 15-year-old and You'll see on the slide that it says 16-year-old, and I'm just going to back up for a second, um, and Lorraine and Katie can wait for just a second, please. Um, Jen was, was kind enough to remind me that Washington State um, has different ages of, of consent than what I was used to. So the age of consent in Washington, as you all probably know, is 16, and it has this 48-month um, window um, for ages. So I didn't realize that. So um, when Katie and Lorraine are going to read through the role play, we're going to make this youth be 15 years old and um, the other person that they're with 19 years old so that they fall into this, this framework. So the following role play is um, a 15-year-old female to male trans person who is brought in by his parents to the hospital that has a sexual assault treatment center. They, the parents inform the intake staff that their son is transgender and the victim of statutory rape by a 19-year-old. Their 15-year-old, a minor, does not speak on his own behalf until directly asked if, asked if he would like to have an advocate. He says yes, and an advocate is called. Hello, I am the sexual assault advocate you requested. My name is Janie. I'm sorry to meet you under these circumstances. Are you parents? It is standard practice for us to meet first with the victim alone. Let me walk you to the waiting area. Is there anything you would like to drink or anything that could make you comfortable while you wait? We'll be back in a little while. Would you like to come with me? Let's head to this room down the hall. Hi, again, my name is Jenny and my pronoun is she. I'm so sorry you've been assaulted. I wasn't assaulted. You weren't assaulted? No, I wasn't. My parents are forcing me to be here. Why are they forcing you to be here? Can you tell me more about what happened? Fine. So I went to this after-school event, and I met someone there, and we went for a ride together, and we had sex. And I stupidly told my parents. They found out that my partner was 19, and I'm 15, and so here we are. Oh. So you do not want to pursue a sexual assault charge against the person you had sex with? No, I don't want to be here, and I'm certainly not going to undress for anyone here. No one will force you to do anything against your will, anything you don't want to do. But we do have a dilemma here since you are technically still a minor, and your parents are legally responsible for you. I'm here for you, and I want to be really clear that my role is to help you. At the same time, we still need to operate under the rules where your parents are legally in charge. So part of my job is to be here for you and to help you know what your options are. Would you like to hear what some of those choices are? I guess. Okay, sexual assault exams aren't just about physical exams. Part of what happens is that your story of what happened to you is recorded. So that gives you an opportunity to tell your side of what happened. There are also many types of physical exams and health services that we can talk about too. 
both that will help you stay as healthy as possible and support you by noting evidence that your account of what happened was consensual. No, I am not undressing. Okay, I hear you. Let me share a bit more about what we can do for you here. Sometimes when people have sex, consensual or not, they may not have used barrier protections like condoms or dental dams. That might mean that a person is exposed to sexually transmitted infections. Wait, really? Because we didn't have anything with us, so maybe I am at risk. You might be. And we can do some testing and give you some medication to help with any possible infection. Okay, that might be okay. I also wanted to bring up the possibility of pregnancy. I know you may refer to your body in other words than what I'm going to use, so please correct me, okay? People who have vaginal penile penetration can be at risk for pregnancy. Is that something that might apply to your situation? Uh, well, um, so I'm actually taking testosterone. I can't get pregnant. Thanks for sharing with me that you are taking testosterone. That's useful information for me to know. Unfortunately, testosterone doesn't always protect against pregnancy, even though a lot of trans men and transmasculine people think it does. Um, which makes me remember, I'd like to use language that reflects your identity. Do you identify as a trans man or non-binary or? No, oh, I identify as a trans man, definitely. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. I want to get it right, and I want to support you. So based on what we talked about, are you concerned about pregnancy? Yeah, I guess so. I haven't thought about that before. I mean, I guess it might be an issue. So do I just, what, do I tell you my story, and then I get some pregnancy testing? Yes. Let's look at what we can do for you. Usually pregnancy testing won't show a positive or negative result right after someone has sex. But what we can offer is some medication that will help you not get pregnant. You may have heard about it. The morning after pill? I'm totally interested in that. You have no idea how it would mess me up if I got pregnant. Okay, good. It sounds like we have a plan then, right? Let me go talk to the same nurse first. And then if you want, I will accompany you while she talks with you. Does that work for you? Your parents can stay out in the waiting area until we're done. Yeah, that sounds fine. I want you to be there with me. Okay, so that was role play three. Um, and I just wanted to, to start out by saying that I think Katie is a great teenager. Um, so that was really um, cool to hear some of the, the attitude that was coming through in both the 13-year-old and this, this 15-year-old role play. Um, so let's break this, this role play down a little bit, too. Um, so what did we what do we learn here? What are the main points? And I think you know again what we heard um, a lot through all three of these is the the important role of listening and reflecting back and asking appropriate questions. Um, one of the things that was really important with this one is the the really critically important piece of having a private conversation, a one on one conversation. So in this case, it was important to do a couple of things, like determine that um, neither parent was the abuser. So I think it's always important to um, make sure that that whoever um, is coming in for sexual assault, um, you know, treatment or, or forensic exam, that we know that the people that are around them, or can be as sure as we can, that the other people are not um, the abuser or abusers. The private conversation also allowed the youth to emphatically state that this was not an assault, so that's really important that that happened. Um, and the privacy of the conversation probably allowed for the advocate and teen to have a conversation that was more intimate than if the parent had been in the room with them. So the teen shared um, a little bit about what happened sexually, at least enough so that there could be um, some discussion about potentially um, you know, getting treatment for sexually transmitted infections or for pregnancy prevention. The private conversation also gave us um, gave the youth a lot of control over the situation and what was going to happen or not happen with his body. So the advocate was really respectful and um, really believed the survivor, which you know I know all of us do when we're working with survivors. And I think this was really critically important, even in this case when no assault happened. So the the advocate was really believing of what this what this person was saying. 
So although the parents in this case may still want to pursue legal action, there's a bit of a compromise that was made um, in the, the role, through the role of the advocate. So the parents may not know it yet, but um, there was some compromise made. So the advocate backed the client in ways that allowed him to be central with what was happening to his body and his experience. Um, and in many ways that, um, you know, there still was evidence collected. Um, so the parents are still kind of getting what they want in essence um, because this this teenager was able to tell the story of what happened and that it was not abuse. The advocate um, also knew enough about trans issues and trans bodies to know that he was still at possible, possible risk of pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections. So because of this knowledge, this knowledge that the advocate already had, it allowed them to have that discussion um, and then get appropriate screening and um, pregnancy blocking drugs. So those things are really good that um, all of those things happened. We're going to shift now and, and share with you some resources and then some what you can do. And Lori's going to head us through the, the resources section. Thanks. I do want to point out that um, we're going to highlight primarily FORGE resources. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that uh, other resources that focus on youth typically focus on LGBT youth. Um, so ours might be a little bit more narrow. Thanks to funding from the Office on Violence Against Women, we have created over 50 hours of free webinars, all archived on our website. There are several Trans 101 webinars, which are pretty much identical in content. Additionally, there are others that build on Trans 101 concepts and focus on some specific issues that help advocates better serve transgender survivors. For example, we have archived webinars on forensic exams with trans SA survivors, working with rural trans survivors, creating a trans welcoming environment, the Violence Against Women Act, non-discrimination conditions, stalking basics and trans individuals, strategies for improving trans police relations, transgender survivors in detention, sex work and violence, and new laws and policies for improving trans survivors' lives. So that's some of what we've got. While we know that most of you work primarily with sexual assault survivors, these webinars that are upcoming are on sheltering. We know that sometimes sexual violence occurs within the dynamics of a relationship, and sometimes sexual assault survivors who are in a relationship that is unhealthy may need to find shelter. These upcoming webinars, which are not yet scheduled, will mirror some new publications that will be coming out in the next few months. They're on sheltering trans men, sheltering trans women, sheltering non-binary individuals, and one on confronting bias with a trauma-informed lens. In June 2014, the Office for Victims of Crime released the Responding to Transgender Victims of Sexual Assault Toolkit. We work closely with OBC to transform FORGE-created written documents into a more interactive online toolkit. The toolkit offers both Trans 101 content and extensive trans-specific sexual assault information for service providers. We encourage you to explore this toolkit, as many as the links to our website and other resources contained within it. The FORGE website includes many short tip sheets as well as much longer documents. The majority are written for victim service providers, but some are intended for trans survivors and their loved ones. Some provider-oriented documents that advocates might be interested in include what you see here, trans-specific safety planning tool. It's important to note that although the title includes intimate partner violence, this is very much geared toward helping people who are in abusive relationships, including those that are sexually abusive. We encourage providers to work through it with their clients, particularly their youth clients. Another document that's available on the website is Trans People in Bathrooms, Safety for All, Talking Points for Sexual Assault Organizations. That was created this past year in response to several sexual assault coalitions wanting to dispel the myth that trans people are harmful to others in bathrooms. 
There are also multiple short fact sheets on the intersections of transness and violence. Another document we have is First Do No Harm, Eight Tips for Addressing Violence Against Transgender and Gender Non-Binary People. This provides an intersectional lens of how we communicate about trans people and violence and reminds us all to not create hierarchies of violence, who is most effective, and who deserves attention and care, since those also end up excluding others. Another document is Let's Talk About It, The Trans Survivor's Guide to Accessing Therapy. That one's written for trans survivors, but can be very useful for advocates, too. It's 170 pages, and it asks things like how to decide if therapy is right for you, how to choose the best type of therapy for you, how to find referrals and choose a therapist, and the guide also discusses trans-specific survivor issues, such as dealing with the standards of care issues, addressing shame and body image or body dysphoria issues, and navigating sex-segregated services. We encourage you to suggest this for your clients whenever it's appropriate. Similarly, this guide, a self-help guide to healing and understanding, is aimed at trans survivors. It's also a very long document, but it discusses the basics of what trauma is, how people's brains work when they experience trauma, as well as very, very practical content for healing. It includes information about sexual violence prevalence against trans people, common long and short-term responses to trauma, possible relationships between sexual assault and gender identity issues, discussion of standards of care models as they relate to sexual assault survivors and how their gender, I'm sorry, gender identity issues are assessed, how transgender survivors can advocate for their inclusion and or respectful treatment within such services, recommended reading and resource lists of self-help books, websites, and listservs, and quotations from other transgender sexual violence survivors a guide for partners and friends of transgender sexual violence survivors covers similar content as the self-help guide, supplemented with discussions of how secondary survivors are impacted by a loved one's sexual abuse or assault, advice on self-care and finding support for secondary survivors, and tips on supporting a primary survivor. I want to note that this one is is going to be available very shortly, but is not quite available yet. This document, too, a guide for facilitators of trans community groups supporting sexual violence survivors, has some of the core information on trauma, but it's designed to help group facilitators recognize and appropriately address the types of behaviors and concerns that trans and non-binary survivors may bring to support groups. This uh, publication also is in its final stages of being put on the website. Michael? Great. Thank you, Larie. So the next few minutes we wanted to talk about what you can do both as um, a staff person in an organization as well as um, what you can do personally. And, and I know some people really um, clearly divide their professional and personal lives, but um, I think a lot of us understand the role of the personal as well as the professional. So um, if you'll humor me, um, that's how we've divided this, this next section. So there's a lot of things that um, that folks can do, and we've talked about some of them already, and um, it bears repeating some of them. So um, one of the things that you can do as a professional in an organization is get training. So all of you are here, so you get like a, a brownie point for it because you're here. Yay. Um, so we encourage um, – organizations to get regular training, and, and by regular we, we mean at least once a year that all staff in an organization is trained, and that means front desk to clinical staff, cleaning staff to executive director, so everybody within um, your brick-and-mortar space or everybody within your agency. 
we encourage agencies to take a stand. So um, I believe the Washington Coalition signed on to this petition that's on the screen and um, this letter and, and many other things recently because a lot of times coalitions and organizations really believe strongly in social justice issues and um, issues that affect the people that they serve. So um, if your agency is, is able to do things like write letters or attend rallies or sign petitions, we encourage you to do that. And, you know, we know that sometimes agencies can't do that, but um, to be present in those political places if it's possible. Um, having bathrooms that all people can access with confidence and safety is, is really important. And this might be as simple as putting up inclusive and welcoming signs, or it might be more complicated and expensive, like remodeling your building. And we know that a lot of agencies can't do the, the latter, but um, just about everybody can put a, a different sign or message of welcome or message of inclusion around their bathrooms. We encourage folks to connect with their trans and LGBT organizations. So know about the organizations that are in your community, in your state, or even national organizations, and then connect with them. Partner with them on, on projects. Um, be able to work with them or refer clients to them as appropriate. And those organizations will refer clients to you as well. We encourage you to be inclusive in your literature, and, and literature we mean things like what kind of brochures you have as well as what kind of websites, what kind of handouts, so that language that's used is inclusive of people of, of all gender identities and, and experiences. And if you, if you don't have brochures or would like some, we are more than happy to send you um, as many as you would like. So we have brochures and some other things that are not linked to geography, so um, contact us and we will be happy to send them to you. We encourage organizations and, and providers to let people know what their rights are. Um, I think a lot of adults don't know what their rights are, and I think a lot of youth are in some ways less in the know than, than the adults around them. Sometimes it goes the other way around. But let them know that they're covered and protected under things like the Violence Against Women Act, which does not allow discrimination against gender identity or gender expression, um, or Title IX like we've talked about in schools, um, or, the, or HUD, or whatever is appropriate. Uh, for the services that they're seeking. So remind them that they deserve to be treated with respect, and you'll do that as well as make sure that you will, will try to make sure that everybody that you refer them to and work with will also um, do their best to treat them with respect and dignity. We encourage folks to take a harm reduction approach. Um, we recognize that, you know, recognizing that both youth and survivors may engage in, in coping behaviors like alcohol, drugs, cutting, sex, over or under eating, and other behaviors that might seem um, dangerous or destruct destructive to, to themselves or to others. So whenever possible, help survivors reduce their overall level of potential harm. So keep in mind, too, that um, intersections can help you remember um, what your priorities are, which is likely to serve your clients in the best ways that you can. And if you keep an eye on the goal of serving your clients um, and focusing on your mutual goals with that client, um, you're likely going to do really well in achieving a positive outcome uh, for them. And this is, this is kind of an obvious one, but remember that one of the ways to reduce the, reduce the health and other impacts of minority stress is to help foster an environment of support. So support is directly related to, um, to shifting the impact of minority stress. So that leads us into talking about um, micro-inclusion, so what you can do um, individually. Some of these things you can do as an organization, but these are really about what you can do um, as a person walking through the world. Um, so I, I talked before about microaggressions, and what I'd like to close with are things that you can do that would be considered micro-inclusions. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this concept, and I wasn't until very recently, micro-inclusions are a small step to include someone. On a bigger scale, micro-inclusions are symbolic actions that force us to recall the humanity of others. Many of us saw Loretta Lynch, the Attorney General, U.S. Attorney General, um, speak on, on HB2, North Carolina's um, ruling that was anti-trans, and um, many trans people reported how her speech made them cry. And she looked directly into the camera, and she said, let me speak directly to the transgender community itself. 
Some of you have lived freely for decades, and others of you are still wondering how you can possibly live the lives that you were born to live, to lead. But no matter how isolated, no matter how afraid, no matter how alone you may feel today, know this. The Department of Justice, and indeed the entire Obama administration, want you to know that we see you, we stand with you, and we will do everything we can to protect you going forward. And please know that history is on your side. So this was a huge micro-inclusion. She saw the trans community, and the trans community felt it and saw her. Another thing that, that individuals can do are simple things like wearing buttons um, or putting buttons on your bulletin board or doing things that show little signs that, um, that say, I'm cool with you, or like one of the, the role plays said, I'm down with that. So we encourage little symbols that you don't even have to say anything and they're there and your clients will know what, what, where you stand on trans issues. Another really simple thing that you can do is, is introduce yourself. And by that, we encourage folks to um, introduce themselves with name and pronoun. So you can say something as simple as, my name is Michael and I use he, him, and his. What's your name and what pronouns do you use? Really simple introduction. And it, it allows people to, to tell you if they want to tell you what their pronouns are. And these last four that I'd like to share with you are I think probably more important than any kind of policy or practice or, or some of those things that we can put in writing. And they're really about what we do with our bodies and what we do with our, our intentions. And um, I encourage people to be aware of what your body language is. Um, are we leaning forward when we talk to somebody or are we pulling back? Um, are we engaged with them that shows them that we care and that we're listening? The same is true for eye contact, and you know I know that a lot of times survivors are are cautious and do not want to make eye contact or feel uncomfortable with that level of intimacy. But it's really important for survivors in general, and um, I think trans survivors in particular, to know that a, a provider is seeing them, an advocate is seeing them, literally and figuratively, um, and it shows again that you care. In, in a lot of ways that just can't be expressed through through words. And touch is another one of those things, and I know that it's not always appropriate, and it's not appropriate for every kind of provider, but when it is appropriate and with the consent of, of a client that you're working with, um, it's really important to, to see if we can, can touch people and show them that we care and that we're with them through touch. So, you know, I encourage people to think about if you would normally offer a client a hug or hold their hand or put your arm around their shoulder, um, one of the ways that we can show our, our humanity in, and making, you know, a connection with each other is through these simple things. So eye contact and body language and touch are three really essential ways to do this. And again, it says, I see you, I care about you, you're valued. And I know that some of you will recognize the person in this picture. So it's the image is um, Jeffrey Tambor, who's the actor who plays Mara in Transparent. And we use this image with the, the permission of the mom who, who posted it of her, her child. And the last thing that I wanted to, to mention and to talk about is is kindness. And um, it sounds really simple, but it can be really profound. So when we reach out to people and we can be kind to our clients or our coworkers or our neighbors or our family members or the people at 7-Eleven or the gas station or wherever we are in the world, if we can be kind to them, it can really have a profound effect. So I know a lot of us have seen those, those bumper stickers that say, commit random acts of kindness. And, you know, I want to just, just point out that kindness is really contagious and being nice goes a long way. So when you can, be kind to others and be kind to yourself, and it will make a huge difference, not only in the lives of the people that you are kind to, but also in the gestalt of the kindness around the world. And that has a profound effect in, in terms of, of people who are survivors and the trans youth that we are serving. So we have around 10 minutes left, and um, I don't know if questions have been coming in, but now is a great time um, to type in questions or comments in the chat area. And I know Laurie might be already ready with some questions that have come in. And we yes, will, uh, I am ready with some questions. All right. The first one has to do with the third role play, and the question is, isn't it against the law for someone older to have sex with an underage child or teenager? And don't we have to report to child protective agencies, 
even if the child says that it wasn't abuse to them? And I think Jen is going to answer this one, Michael. That would be really good. Hi, so this is Jen. Um, yeah, thank you so much for uh, that question. Uh, and the answer is that it differs. Um, it differs throughout the United States from state to state. In our state, in Washington, um, 16 is uh, the age at which we, we no longer have laws around, um, uh, it's like the age of consent, right, for Washington State. So in the, uh, in the third role play, the survivor was 15. And um, the person they, uh, they, they experienced as having consensual sex with was 19, and so that would be uh, against the law in Washington State, and that would, yes, require a report to CPS. And, of course, as advocates, we try to give as much information beforehand about our requirement as mandated reporters, but um, in this state, that would require uh, a mandated report. And so what I would suggest for the person who asked this question is to um, just look into uh, the laws in your state to find out that information. Thank you, Jim. The next question I have is for Michael. Can you recommend a resource that has information about what medications and changes transgender youth may be going through? It was really great in the second role play that the advocate knew that the meds did not prevent pregnancy. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm thinking about there's a, there's a couple of resources that I believe talk about youth. Um, one might be a little bit um, hard to read. One is the the WPATH standards of care, which outline a lot of um, issues around um, what happens with hormone use, and I believe they dis they discuss the, what happens with youth. I know they have their recent issue talks about um, hormone blockers which may be um, useful as well. So um, that's the WPATH standard of care. So I think it's WPATH.org is where you can find those. Um, the other places that you may want to look are um, the San Francisco. I'll find it in a second. I will, I will come, let me come back to that. Okay, while you're looking for that, Michael, um, we were asked early on if we knew of any organizations similar to FORGE based in Canada? I think 519 is still in, in business, and they're a 501c3 trans-based organization that has done a lot of stuff with anti-violence. And I have the, the protocol that I was thinking of. So the protocol that I was thinking of um, for trans, that would include trans youth is at transhealth.ucsf.edu slash protocols. Again, it's and I have someone who has a participant who has helpfully added that the WPATH website does say that it's $22 to get a hard copper, uh, hardcover copy of the uh, standards of care. But if you search for WPATH PDF, then you can find a free digital form. Excellent. And I just typed into the chat um, area the other protocol out of UCSF. So slightly different. Great. Any other questions? Michael, that's all the questions I have. Well, that's good. It might be the end of the day for a lot of folks. Um, so I just wanted to remind people that if, if you would like trans-specific um, paper materials, so brochures or, or flyers for your offices, we'd be happy to send them to you. And if you think of questions afterwards and you'd like to, to ask them, feel free to, to contact any of the three of us, which you'll see on your screen now. Um, email is, I think, the best way to reach all of us, but we're more than happy to have continued dialogue. So thanks for, for all being here today, and we really always enjoy um, partnering with the Washington Coalition. So thanks for being here, and thanks to the Coalition for, for asking us to be here again. And thank you so much. It was wonderful. That was a really wonderful webinar. Um, so as a reminder, I just want to ask everyone uh, who participated in the webinar, please fill out your short evaluation and let us know if others were on the webinar with you. And you can email that to jen at wixap.org. And a recording of today's webinar materials will be posted on the website under trainings and then under recorded webinars. Uh, thank you again so much, Katie, Lurie, and Michael. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.